Good evening everyone. It's Wednesday, it's 6.30. That means it's time for our evening reflection. I am, uh, as always, the Reverend Matthew Ritchie from Nilston Parish Church. It was so good to see so many of you tuning in last week. And it's great that so many of you, cho you have chosen to tune in this week as well. Our midweek reflection is simply a space for us to uh, turn to the Word of God, to maybe get some encouragement from that, and to think about what God has in store for us over this next week. Um, please do let us know uh, how you, what you think of all of our online content, either in the comments or by messaging us directly. We do love to hear from you. This week we're going to be looking at um, Matthew 5, verses 21 to 27. Uh, to 37. This is a uh, um, passage probably most of you have heard before. But we're going to be looking at it in hopefully a wee bit of a new way. Before we turn to that though, let's pray. Our God, as we take a few minutes out of our evening to turn to you, we pray that you would be with us nourishing us with your word, helping us to put aside all the things of this world and focus on you. Be with us, our God. Be with us now and forever. Amen. Let's turn to the word. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger to the fires of hell. Therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother, then come and give your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary so that they do not take you to court. Do it while you're still with him on the way or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown in prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out, of, uh, get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of the body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better you lose one part of your body than the whole body go to hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. Anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep oaths until you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all. either by heaven, or by God's throne, or by earth, or by its footstool, or by Jerusalem, or by its city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. You know, two things that occupy me the most at the moment are the internet and parenting, at least partly because of how much time I spend googling how to parent. <laughs> With the schools closed I'm spending a lot more time around my children. Um, I'm trying to homeschool them or trying to do these things and uh, they're just here a lot more. And with us not being in buildings, um, the internet, uh, these ways of communicating are taking over from a lot of the stuff that I normally do. Today's passage, I think, combines 
the two most annoying of those uh, different things though. The YouTube comment section and the phrase, but what you said is, so much of my life is spent online. Whether it's using various commentaries and Bible study tools that I use to prep for this, whether it's uh, servicing the Facebook or the YouTube account, whether it's uh, making these videos, editing them and uploading them, whether it's just spending time with the global community of God's family. It's what I do for work, but it's also part of my leisure. Talking about and consuming media is about my hobbies. Even on a practical level, before lockdown, how many of us attempted a DIY project without so watching someone do it on YouTube first? How many of us went somewhere without Googling it to see the route? Or who'd know what was going on in the world without news apps and websites? The internet's great, as long as you stay above the line. Because if you go below the line, that's to the bottom half of the page. You're going to find the comment section. One of the things the internet has brought into our lives is the ability for people to say exactly what they think, exactly when they think it, to exactly the person they think it about. Which can sometimes, uh, hopefully as you find, be a great thing. It's allowed us to communicate during lockdown. It's allowed us to do these services. It's allowed us to worship. It's led to a proliferation of ways to tell people we're thinking about them or love them. And it's great. But it comes with an equal proliferation of ways to tell people we hate them or that they suck or that their taste in subtitle fonts makes them a Nazi. True story. Now, I love my kids, but the phrase that, phase that Adam's in at the moment is called, at least by us, the little lawyer phase. Or, it is now. It's the part where Adam attempts to find loopholes to almost every rule we set. We came downstairs, quite recently, to find Adam tucking into a muffin that had been left on the kitchen table the night before. A muffin that was meant for the kids in one of um, my wife's groups. A muffin that was on the kitchen table that he is not allowed to go into without asking. I hope I was understandably annoyed with him. I said, what did we tell you about going into the kitchen in the mornings? It's okay, Dad, he responded. I didn't touch the floor. I went to check and... Sure enough, Adam had used two chairs, or a roll of kitchen roll, and several other things to make sure that he could get from the baby gate to the kitchen table and back again without actually touching the floor. He turned the instruction, don't set one foot in that kitchen, into a game of the floor is lava. It's, in fairness, hilarious. But obviously Adam had a banoffee muffin for breakfast that day. Adam had fallen into one of the great traps of moral history, legalism. Now, legalism is great when you're talking about an actual legal code for a, a country or a nation or whatever. The idea that things are illegal or legal, depending on strict interpretation of a written text, is actually great. If I can be put in prison uh, for something, then it's important I know where the line is. I, I, I need to know, yes, I can do that, or no, I can't. But morally and relationally, legalism is really bad. I once had a friend who told his wife that he'd not technically cheated on her. A technicality that she didn't appreciate, and a technicality that didn't stop her leaving him and taking the cat. Now our Gospel looks at um, part of the Sermon on the Mount, an address that I think does two things for us. It talks about legalism and harm short of action. The foundation of the law, the foundation of Jesus' teaching, has always been what we call the rule of love. The notion described by Jesus 
as love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and love your neighbour as yourself. The additional commandments, the laws, the prophets, the things Jesus tells us are, are, are all about how we do that in practice. They're about how we do show that love, what that love looks like. The problem with a legalistic attitude is it's all about what we do and not why or how. Now Jesus gives us a couple of great examples. The law says don't murder and, well, most of us haven't. I haven't and I'm assuming you haven't as well. But just because you don't murder a person doesn't mean that you love them. The line between love and not love isn't murder. Most people manage their whole life without murdering anybody, but that's not the point. Have you ever called someone names? Have you ever wished that they were dead? Have you ever hated someone? For the Pharisees and the upholders of the Jewish law, it was about strict adherence to the law. But for Jesus, it's about love. The attitude of love that we show to each other. A colleague of mine a wee while ago was getting quite a tough time online. She voiced something of an unpopular opinion. Um, nothing hateful, or, but in some quarters it really unpopular. Ever since then, she's had to put up with a lot. Some of the comments that have been sent to her, I am not even going to tell you. I don't want to, you really don't want to see them. Jokes about violence and, and more. Personal attacks on her character, her appearance, all sorts of things. She's getting the worst of the internet that I spoke about at the start. What's more worrying is that some of the worst of all of that is directed to her from other Christians. Some of them other pastors in her own denomination. Have any of them broken the law? Well, apparently not. The police say they haven't. Have any of them physically attacked her? No, no. Have any of them ever met her? Generally not. Is she actually worried about being murdered? No, in, in honesty, she isn't. But is she feeling the love of her brothers and sisters in Christ? Absolutely not. It's not the actions of these people that matter. Although you can say that speech and typing are actions if you want, but it's the attitude that matters. The thoughts and the speech. Jesus is clear. If you say raka to your brother, you're answerable to God. If you think about someone lustfully, you've committed adultery in your mind. It's about thought, intent. It's about our attitude of love. But it's not just about online. It's about the things we say behind people's backs, the things we tell ourselves about them. It's about the people who are pleasant too to their faces, but then curse under our breaths. For Jesus, it's not just about actions, it's about attitudes. It's about loving and being loved. Just because we don't hurt people physically, doesn't mean it's okay to say or think things about them that aren't loving. The rule of love is the core of Jesus' teaching. And it's not just about our actions. If we focus on actions, then it gives us license to do a lot of things. Legalism lets us circumvent the letter of the law. It allows us to be mean as long as we're clever. It allows us to threaten people without recognising the harm that that does. It lets us do emotional damage and tell people to toughen up. It lets us have others do our violence for us. Let's us destroy people as long as we are subtle. Let's us hate as long as we do it from afar. Let's us have muffins for breakfast as long as we don't touch the floor. Jesus today completely rejects that legalism. But he also redefines the law. Not to make them easier, but to make them more absolute. A Dutch theologian in the 17th century wrote that our thoughts are like water in a river. 
They come and they go and they are quickly forgotten. But they always go somewhere. Ask the man that lives below the waterfall. Thoughts lead to actions. Unloving thoughts lead to unloving actions. And loving thoughts will always bring about loving actions. Love is an attitude. Love God. Love one another. And stop making excuses. And no, we can't have muffins for breakfast. That's been our midweek reflection. Um, why don't we spend a wee minute in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you for all of that amazing love that you send out towards us, the blessings that you pour upon us. Help us too to be loving. Not, uh, but not just loving in our actions, loving in our hearts. Let us pour that love out to others, not just because it looks good, but because it's what we want to do. Our God, we thank you for the love we've been shown. Shown by you directly and shown by you through others. We thank you for all your love. We pray that you would strengthen us to show love to those around us. In our thoughts, in our words and in our actions. We thank you for all this. In Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. We'll have another midweek reflection next week, uh, Wednesday, 6.30. Also check out, if you've got young kids, our children's story time, Tuesdays at 6.30. And uh, remember, 11 o'clock Sunday mornings, uh, we've got our service as normal. We're also going to be starting our Lent Bible studies, and you're going to get some information about those very soon as well as information about our new evening services on a Sunday, something which we are really excited about, and information will be online very soon about how you can join those in live. My prayer for today is that God would bless you, raise you up, and keep you close in this day and all days. Amen. See you later. <laughs>